flag BLQ data in Phoenix and how to use these values in both NCA, but more importantly, when fitting the data. <clears throat> so I'd like to remind you, this is a 30 minute webinar. Um, you have all been muted. And if you want to ask a question, use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. I'll try to address as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. So my name is Simon Davis. I'm based in the UK. I've been at Satara for 15 years now. Prior to that, I worked at Interface with their and also their Connect software, uh, again, providing support and training. Before that, when I had a real job, I worked for a phase one CRO performing uh, PK analysis, primarily with NCA, but also a little bit of modeling and simulation. So today, what I want to cover is what is a BLQ value and why does it matter? How we can handle these BLQ values in Phoenix um, and that's going to be in particular to uh, the um, Stuart Beale's paper of 2001 and some other references I'll state at the end of the presentation. And that'll include a Phoenix uh, demonstration using 8.3, which includes a new plot generated in the visual predictive checks. So firstly, I just want to sort of um, clarify what I mean when I talk about BLQ or LLOQ, what we're talking about is a lower limit of quantification. And this is something that the bioanalysis lab works to in terms of compliance with guidelines. They can actually detect data lower than that down to the limit of detection, which in the lab is normally set to two or three times the background noise. However, data is often censored below this limit of quantification. You just receive, okay, it was below that level, whether it's five nanograms per mil or whatever. You don't know what that information is, and that presents you with a quandary as to how to use that data. Do you ignore it totally? Um, do you substitute it for zero and so forth? And we'll investigate that in more detail in the later slides. Whilst I'm here, I may as well mention the upper limit of quantification. Sometimes I've been asked questions, what do I do with data above the limit of quantification? There are a few um, relatively esoteric modeling approaches to that, uh, but generally, you shouldn't see that in final data. Normally, the lab will uh, dilute those samples and um, bring them back into the uh, calibrated assay range. So you should normally see those in final data, any sort of ALQ or above lift quantification data. And that's just a reiteration that precision is what um, a measure of the uh, repeatability of that sample, how accurate it is um, in terms of CV percent. And then you have the accuracy calculated against standard um, QC samples, typically the low, mid, and upper ranges of the calibrated range. So back in 2001, Stuart Beale um, put in a paper uh, about how to handle this and different approaches with the um, software he was using, which was NunMem, and how to um consider different substitutions of that. So the first one, uh, and I've tried to group these into sort of four categories. He listed seven, and subsequent papers have actually added a few other methods, but we'll stick with these seven for now. So I've listed these as simply ignoring it. So it's once it's below the level of quantification, treat it as missing. And that's what many people have done for a long time. It's very simple to implement, just ignore that data. Another alternative is to impute a value. And he describes three methods, M5 and M6, which involved replacing BLQ uh, with an arbitrary value, uh, typically half the level of quantification. And he, um, whether you replace just the first value or all of the values after T last, was the difference between M5 and M6. And M7 was to replace the first BLQ value with a zero and then discard the rest. Now, generally those methods um, aren't recommended and um, since we've got software uh, that we can handle the estimation of likelihood of this we will look at those preferred methods m2 m3 and m4 for the rest of the uh, presentation so what we're looking at here is the what group i've called c estimate likelihood and these are different ways to 
uh, first of all, flag and sense the data and then to estimate them. So whether um, that likelihood looks at all the measured concentrations and then estimates that those values, which are going to be great the level of quantification, the M3 method, which estimates the likelihood that the BLQ concentration is less than the lower level of quantification, and included in that will be negative values. There's no lower limit on that. And that might sound strange because a true concentration you wouldn't expect to be negative. But if you're using perhaps a proportional error, once you add in that error back to the concentration, you may indeed get a negative value. And then the M4 method, which um, says the concentration is less than lower level quantification, but greater than zero. So it's quite similar to M3, but it's extra limit. Now, generally, uh, M3 and M4 perform better, and it somewhat depends on the residual error model used, which is more appropriate. So if you set up um, Phoenix and you choose the BQL option in Phoenix, you'll be using the M3 method by default. Um, however, if you had, for instance, a log additive error model, that would effectively become the M4. Now, the last option I've got here is D, using the actual value. And that's saying, go back to your lab and ask them nicely if you can have all the data above the limit of detection. And this might be difficult depending on the lab's SOPs and you know, this general um, practice in uh, GLP labs not to reveal the data below the limit of quantification. But um, actually, if that is available, you'll generally get much better um, precision of your parameter estimates and much better likelihood of choosing the right structural, right residual error model. So that would always be the preferred option if possible. But what we want to look at in this presentation is what can I do if I don't have those actual values and what are the best options to do? So <clears throat> if your data's come in um, to Phoenix, there's a couple of data tools you can use. You can use the data wizard uh, to do simple substitutions. Um, but we also have a BQL tool, been there for a while. And the advantage of this is it allows time-dependent substitution. And that's particularly important for the M5, 6, and 7 methods, where you can treat the BQL values dependent on the position in the profile. So you can see here, uh, I've said, OK, it's before Tmax. I might set that to 0. If it's embedded in the profile, I might set it as missing. The first consecutive value after Tmax is half level of quantification. Then it's 0. And then if I've had several values BQL and something becomes quantifiable again, I say maybe that's not uh, plausible and I will force it back to being zero again. I'm not saying this is what you should do. It's just an example of a business rule you might want to implement with the software. Um, so sometimes people use this in NCA particularly because it helps identify T lag, this forcing data to zero before T max when it's BQL. Uh, it can help reduce underestimation of AUC. And sometimes you might want to, particularly for log plots, um, create a value that you can then plot the BLQ data on your graph. Now, this is the same tool, the BQL tool here, but set up as I might use it for NLME. So now I'm looking at modeling the data. And rather than make position-dependent substitutions, I'm simply going to flag it when it's less than LOQ or when it's being flagged as BQL in the data. And it can be any flag, it could be less than 0.5, if that was what your um, level qualification was. Um, and it's going to sense that value and set a flag. So then I know how to handle that. Okay, so we're not modeling it here, this is just a data preparation step. So let's look at the data we'll be using mostly in the presentation. This is what the raw data looks. We've got a level of quantification, which is uh, 0.15. And in this case, just so you understand, I've actually got the full data here. So I've also got the um, values which were seen below the level of quantification. This actually is a data which was simulated from a 2008 paper by Arns, Castle, Dunn and Ludden, um, exactly to look at comparing different uh, substitution methods for BQL. Okay, 
So that's what the simulation gave people, uh, gave the authors and what we're going to be using. Everything below the level qualification, I haven't joined in the lines, but those do relate to these uh, profiles above. What you would actually see is this, most likely. The lab would provide you data, and you can see we've lost information below the level of quantification. We don't know what those values were. But what the M3 method and its variants uh, allow you to do is those beaker observations are retained uh, and handled as a censored observation so the uh, maximum likelihood estimation method is used to fit the PK model to all the observations and the likelihoods for the BQL observations in particular are taken uh, to be indeed um, related to that level of qualification. And so the true lower concentrations are less likely to be misrepresented. So this sort of yellow shading I've given here is trying to show you there'll be like a um, estimation that the value appeared somewhere around there. It could be estimated to be above the level of quantification, might indeed be estimated to be negative. Um, but it's very hard to see that in the fitting process. So later on, you'll see I'm going to be using some simulations. If you haven't come across these before, they're going to be called, it's the visual predictive check um, as implemented in Phoenix. So I'm going to do a thousand simulations to understand better how the model predicts the data below the level of quantification. I'll be showing you some of those plots later. Okay. So at this point, I want to go into the demo and I'm going to discuss a couple of things. One quick look at the BQL tool and then move into the models. And then we're going to review some examples later. So I'm just going to share my Phoenix project. Hopefully you see that now. Okay. So this is a, a much simpler set of data in this first project. I just uh, got uh, three subjects, a couple of different formulations, and it looks something like this. So got a formulation A, which is more rapidly absorbed. And, sorry, formula should be more rapidly absorbed and uh, formulation slightly slower absorbed here. So what I might do is use a BQL tool to take the raw data. So you can see here, these are less than symbols. So that's BQL data. And I'll show the rule. So just in case they'd used a text value, I've included both. You can include more than one non-numeric code. And I've searched to check for those and said, okay, before Tmax, I'll set to zero. After Tmax, I'll leave it as missing. And then moving on to first value set to LOQ divided by two. And then if I've got more than um, two values in a row, I'll, I'll set that back to zero here as well. Okay. I've set the lower level of quantification here to be 0.1 and the new concentration to be column to be created will be called PK conch, could be called anything. And I'm going to carry over the original concentration column. So what that means is in the results, you can see here's the original concentration and here's the PK concentration. You can see these first values, it substituted that. And so what I did was to illustrate that was I ran the um, NCA set up with the original concentration. And again here with the PK concentration. And one of the impacts of that in this case, I wanted to show for an NCA analysis was that you might then be better able to identify the T uh, lag in that second method. You see here, these NCAs have got some T lags generated. You can see maybe some differences in your T last later on as well. Okay. So that's just a bit of background about the tool. Let's go and have a look at the NLME project. So give you a bit of background. Here's the data. Um, I've plotted it a few times. This is what it looks like by individual. Um, this is the BQL tool I've used to flag the data. So I've created an output column called DV static. Here's the original one. Um, there's a missing data variable that we won't use. That was in the original data set I obtained. And here's the flag we're interested in. So 
for this example, the value is 0.124, which is less than my um, level qualification 0.15. So it's been set to one and the observation that column I'll be using for that is 0.15. So that's informing the model that the level quantification was 0.15. That's set up in this rule set here. Okay. So it's looking for both this non-numeric code and any values below that level of quantification. And doing this censoring. Okay. Um, and then just so you understand the data a bit better, I um, ran a data wizard to filter out some of the records. And this just shows you that um, of the 300 or so records, 23 of them were BLQ. So you see all these numbers here. And that means we're looking at approximately 10% of the data as BLQ in this case. I'll talk about the impact of numbers of uh, or percentages of BLQs in the um, concluding slides later. And then this second row is just showing that I've left all of the observed um, values at time zero as missing. And that lets the model impute the most logical value for that. So, you know, it depends whether you had an absorption or you know, an extravascular model or an IV as to what would be imputed there. But it's better not to force that to some uh, BLQ fit. So what um, do we get? Let's look at the simplest option and, and maybe the ideal one is, you know, using the actual value. If that data exists, um, we would get these estimates for absorption. It's a thing fit as a two compartment model, uh, volume and clearance, good precision here. And our fits look nice using a log, log additive a uh, residual error for this data. So it all looks good. And if I perform a VPC, so VPC is a simulation uh, where I've made 1000 replicates and I've requested um, some lines on the output. You can see here. So the blue dots correspond to the observed data. You can see we've got observed data below the level of quantification here. The red line is the 2.5, 50, and 97.5% confidence intervals for that observed data. And the shadings are um, from the 1,000 uh, predictions. Okay, And you can see they closely agree with each other. So that looks good. You know, that's a, um, Models describe the observed data well. They seem to be in good agreement. So let's go to the um, most likely case, you know, in terms of uh, substitution, we've got the simple M1. So in this case, the data is simply censored and ignored when it falls below the level of quantification. Still get a good fit. The CV percents are um, a margin higher. The estimates look similar. I'll, I'll show you a summary table of that in a moment. And when we look at the VPCs, we can see uh, some differences here. So for instance, the red line, um, which is the 97.5% observed data, this is now biased above the level of quantification. We don't have any data observed below the level of quantification. Um, so that's why that red line's up there. Nonetheless, the models not perform badly in terms of the predictions. Okay, so you can see these shaded areas of how it expects the data to be predicted below the level of quantification for some of those individuals. Okay, uh, and then we come here to um, this sub workflow C, and I've set this up with two different ways of uh, implementing the M3 method. Um, so I'm telling now this BQL option has been unchecked, but here uh, I'm now checking the BQL option. And notice use static LLOQ is not used. This I've called BLQ estimated. So we, we're using this estimation. And I've said data. And that's because it's using the value created in the BQL tool before, this DV static value, and it's using the flag. So that at that point, the engine 
is reading what's observed there and knowing that it's being flagged as being a BQL value. Results give us, again, good CV percent and very similar estimates to what we saw before. Okay, so they're in good agreement. Um, the VPC now with this option is a bit different. So this is the simulation of that same model. And for those of you who are interested, we put the same setup. This is the input. I've made sure my parameters come from the last fitting. You can see the source of the parameters. It's that same method. That's been done for all of these. And here on the run options, uh, it's still the same thousand simulations. But under CObs, there's an option for a BQL plot to be generated and this BQL fraction. So we've now got three plots here. This is the one we saw before. Um, here, again, there'll be no observed data below the level qualification because that's been censored. And uh, part of that means that uh, as the data is now reduced, it wasn't set to, uh, it, it's known that it's BLQ, there is now no longer a 97.5% confidence, oh, sorry, a 2.5 confidence into the observed data in red. As is, there's no data below there to predict that as in the observations, but we still get good predictions below. And these are pretty close to what we've seen in the other models. What's nice, and this was added in 8.3, is we can also check how closely aligned the fraction of BLQ data, of data which is BLQ at any time point. So the red is that fraction at these time points. And again, we've got the uh, confidence intervals from the VPC, and they are in good agreement. So that suggests the model is mimicking well what we observed. Okay. So by the 24 hour point, over 50% of the original data was BLQ. You see this fraction here. Okay, so we've lost quite a bit of information, uh, and, but the models try to um, do the best by using all of the information from the whole uh, data set to predict that data when it falls below level qualification. Okay, the last one I want to show here is the uh, VPC um, where the estimation is. Uh, still BQL, but the static LOQ is actually set in the model. And just when you run this, um, just be aware that you're using, in fact, the observe column here. So this is, in this case, it's got a number in here, and it's BLQ. Um, and it's just um, basically doing that data preparation within the data set. So it means you don't, it's not actually necessary to run the BQL beforehand. Uh, you don't need to flag it. Um, you just it just looks for numbers below that static LOQ that you set, or for uh, any um, flag data with BQL. You don't need a separate BQL flag column. Okay. So I'll just go to the model comparer just to show how similar those look. Um, this is the um, overall. So you can see the log likelihood for those two is exactly the same as you expect. It's the same method being applied, M3, but whether it's flagged originally the data or set in the model. Um, you can't actually use the uh, level of quantification, um, sorry, not level of the minus two log likelihood to distinguish between the models because you've actually got different um, numbers of observations. Uh, and it's not entirely clear from the table. Obviously, this was the full data set where we had 300 observations. In the M1 method, we've lost almost 10%, um, so we're down to 277. Um, and those values have been totally ignored below the level of conclusion. With the M3 method, it's slightly more um, complicated because they've been censored, but it still knows that they will be LQ values. So that number of observations is slightly you know, different in a way. OK, so that's what I want to show in Phoenix. I'm going to go back to my um, presentation. So I'm going to stop showing Phoenix. And I'm back in here. And um, what I did was I wanted to put these plots side by side so you can see a couple of them, try to get them more or less the same scale. Um, 
and compare them a bit more easily. So this is the full data set uncensored versus M1. And you can see how um, they're pretty close to predictions. Um, the observed data, it's got some slight biases in it, it's slightly high because you've just simply ignored the data below level quantification. Um, but that's not bad. Then um, we get the M3 method. We saw that briefly before. Oops, why is that gone there? Excuse me. And the second uh, B cal fraction plot. And you can see those are in close agreement. Um, you can see that as the data has dropped below the level of quantification, obviously that fraction of data has dropped from 30 points to less than 15 by 24 hours for the different profiles. It's useful. And then I wanted to show what the uncensored data looked like versus the BQL method. And yeah, that looks better, I think, than the uh, M1. Just go off a moment. That was the M1. Is. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're both very similar. And then lastly, just comparing the M1 versus M3. So let's side. And again, you see the predictions are very um, similar from the VPC. It's really with the differences we see in the original observed data and the biases inflicted there. So I've uh, gone through a few options here. What would you actually go ahead and use? So in practice, as I said at the beginning, you're going to most often from a GLP lab get sensor data. If you can get hold of the data below the level quantification, I would recommend to use that. Um, and the uh, that would be the ideal well, that's what the authors of the various papers I reference would say. However, um, if you are anticipating and sensor data, um, have a think about what you've got. Uh, have a think about what um, methods you might want to use to handle BQL data. Um, and that might be um, simple censoring of the data, which is the M1 method, just ignoring data below the level quantification, or using the M3 method. And what you'd want to do is estimate um, how good your parameter estimates are, um, are they in similar agreement, what's the CV percent of those, and you can use tools like I showed you the visual predictive check, maybe your bootstraps um, that you would normally use to evaluate models, but you might not be able to use minus two log likelihood because you've got different sets of data being compared. Um, one of the things if you look in the publications is they're almost all done with simulated data um, where they then compare the accuracy and uh, likelihood of finding the correct structural model when the data is um, level of And there's some interesting papers. So um, one of the things it talks about is how um, depending on what the number of compartments are in the model and when your BLQ data occurs and how much there is of it, what impact that might be. So, you know, if you've got a um, two compartment model, you might notice issues with model specification as a low as 10% BLQ data. Whereas a one compartment model might be fine all the way up to 40, maybe even close to 50% of the data being below the level quantification because it's a simpler model um, to fit the data. And so so it's, it's pretty complex um, as to saying which method is best. Um, and it will just depend again, of course, on the residual errors I mentioned, but that would be M3 versus M4 if you had log additive uh, residual error model. Um, but it is uh, definitely worth looking at this M3 method because you might well uh, be able to infer a little bit more information about that data rather than having simply censored it. And I'm sorry, I've jumped ahead of slide again. Almost at time, I know, but there are a couple of uh, caveats. So I already mentioned it. What would you do? It's a case by case spend, uh, basis. It does depend on what data you're seeing. So you've got your 
uh, original data analysis plan, but you might need to check those assumptions are still valid when you receive your final data, um, depending on how much data does turn out to be BLQ and how complicated the model is. It is best to leave your pre-dose data censored, i.e. Um, treat it as totally missing because it is a true unknown. Um, so, because you don't want to overall whatever the model would logically impute for those. And do remember that if you have set an MDV flag and you use that, that will take precedence um, over any other uh, flagging rules you've set. That's just a screenshot I showed you of this BQL fraction, this new feature in um, 8.3. So as a uh, roundup, if you want to use the Phoenix uh, BQL setup, You've got two options sitting in the data or sitting in the model. So if you map the CLBS BQL flag, that will take precedence over the static LLOQ option in the model. So that then that in the reported value is now used in the LOQ, and that means you could have a, a varying LOQ, and that makes um, the sort of tip, uh, typical assumptions you'd make of this M3 method uh, potentially invalid. So if you're going to set it within the model, don't map the flag. So either prep the data with the BQL tool or use the static LLOQ option within the NLME engine. The observed concentration should be a numeric value and the COPS would be flag would be mapped. Okay. And last but not least, when you come to um, looking at your data, don't be surprised that the residuals table won't have any records. It's not able to generate that because there was no originally there was no observed concentration for that point. When, I, when it says DV here, that's dependent variable. Sorry, that's a bit of an old terminology. It just means the concentration or maybe you're doing an effect model. So these are some of the references um, I used when I was putting together this presentation. Um, obviously, Beals is the um, original one here in 2001. They're in date order, I think, if I got them rightly. Uh, the data set we used came from uh, this 2008 paper. And um, I found this particularly accessible, this last um, link directly. It's one of Nick Holford's presentations where he summarizes his paper and a couple of the other comments and gives some useful ideas about how to use it. So I think we're just over time and I will um, open up for questions. Yes, since we are out of time, uh, Simon, we will answer the questions in writing when we provide the report, uh, the recording of the session. There's only a couple of questions, and we will answer them when we provide you the recording, the recording link. Okay. So if you want to wrap up, uh, we can adjourn. Okay. I'm I guess I'm uh, wrapped up. Um, last thing, don't forget, we've got uh, two more um, webinars in this series. Uh, on the 5th of August, there'll be a webinar about creating CSPK domains with Phoenix um, and another one on the 19th, okay, um, which uh, is uh, using the PK submit module within Phoenix. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And we will provide the recording, these slides, as well as the projects to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.